Hello everyone and welcome to this tutorial on the improved lighting and rendering options you'll find in Twinmotion 2020. In this presentation, we'll be looking at the new screen space global illumination effect working with cinematic depth of field using area lights and volumetric lights as well as the new physical sky and enhanced neon lights. The new screen space GI system allows for dynamic indirect lighting and it comes with improved baseline lighting and shadows which more closely match physically based lights. I've added two chairs to the scene, a red one and a green one, and placed them next to a wall. Right now you can see Twinmotion's rendering without global illumination enabled. If we want to enable it though, we'll need to go down to our dock and then select settings. From here we can go to lighting and then you'll find GI or Global Illumination. To turn it on, I'll simply click the word off. Now you can see clearly that the Global Illumination effect is being applied across screen space. The green chair is now reflecting some green light onto the wall, and the red chair is likewise reflecting some red light onto the wall. Now keep in mind that the Global Illumination system inside of Twinmotion is screen space, meaning it only affects what is currently visible on the screen. If I move my camera so that the green chair is no longer on the screen, you'll see that the GI effect begins to disappear. Under GI, we can also click on More to get access to the GI's intensity as well as the distance. We can increase the intensity of the GI light bounces by bringing this slider up. The distance will control how far the light rays bounce. So as I bring this distance slider up, you can see the scene gets brighter. Cinematic depth of field has been greatly improved in twin motion. It now mimics a real-world camera more accurately and has new controls for controlling the distance, focus, and bokeh shapes. Let's have a look. To access our depth of field settings, we'll need to go to the dock and then select Settings. From here, we can select the camera settings, and then we'll find our depth of field. Let's go ahead and turn depth of field on. And then from here, we'll go to More. Under More, we'll find all of the options that we're going to be working with. First of all, we have Distance, followed by Field of View, then aperture size, and finally bokeh shape. In twin motion, the field of view is set to 90 by default for a fairly wide angle. But if we want our depth of field to really show up, we need to bring this angle down. So let's go in for a little bit of a tighter shot here. By adjusting the field of view, you can see that the depth of field effect becomes much stronger. Now there are two ways we can control the focal distance of our camera here. First of all, we can use the distance slider to control this manually. We can also type in a distance here, so I could type in a distance of 5 meters. Or, to make things a little easier, we can use the autofocus tool found at the top of the dock. By selecting the autofocus tool, I can pick a subject to focus in on. Now we're focused in on the girl, and everything else is out of focus. If I wanted to instead focus on the crowd dancing in the background, I'd simply click on one of those people. And now we can see that the girl and the person she's talking to are out of focus, while the rest of the crowd is now in focus. Let's go ahead and return our focus back to the girl, and look at the aperture opening and bokeh shape. Depth of field is controlled by three different factors. That's going to be aperture size or opening, as well as distance, and then finally focal length, which you can control with field of view. As we bring the aperture down to a lower f-stop, you can see how much more out of focus the background becomes while the girl still remains sharply in focus. This is what we call a shallow depth of field, meaning a very limited range of the scene is in focus. If we bring our aperture up to a greater f-stop, the focus becomes greater further away from our focal point, creating a deep depth of field. Let's go ahead and bring our aperture size down to an f-stop of 1. From here, you'll notice the bokeh shapes in the background. We can control the shapes of the bokeh using the bokeh shape slider here. Currently set to a value of 9, this means that our bokeh shapes have 9 sides. Let's go ahead and take this all the way down to a value of 4, and now you can see that the bokehs are shaped more like squares. Of course, we can also type a value in here. Now obviously, the focus here is a little bit too out of focus, so let's go ahead and bring our aperture back up to a more reasonable f-stop. Twin motion materials can easily be set to glow, and Twin Motion comes with a pre-built selection of neon light materials. As of Twin Motion 2020, those neon materials now emit light via screen space global illumination. The light panels in the scene here are making use of a glowing or neon material. So if we use the material picker and then select one of these panels, and then we go into settings, we'll find our glow options. From here, I can go ahead and turn this completely off 
and you can see the effect that it has on the rest of the scene. It's no longer being lit by this particular material. Let's go ahead and bring this back up to a value of 5%, and we can see the scene does become much brighter. To further demonstrate how neon materials work, let's add a sphere to the scene. We'll go into our library, select Options, and then go to Primitives. From here, we're going to find the 1 meter sphere, and I'll drag that into the scene. Now let's go back up to our Materials folder in our library, and then we'll scroll down until we can find the Neons folder. Let's grab the Police Beacon material and drag it onto the sphere. So now we can see how this material is lighting up the rest of the scene. If I drag it around, you'll see the effect it has on the walls. Here is an example of the neon material at work again using the laptop screen here. I'm going to go ahead and bring the glow value up, and as we do, you can see that the coffee mug, as well as the laptop itself and table, begin to get brighter and brighter as the screen emits more and more light. Spot and Omni lights now offer a new haze feature that allows us to easily simulate dust and other particulate matter moving through the light rays. If the environment or weather calls for it, this atmospheric effect can greatly enhance the visual realism of a scene. In order to get some volumetric light rays coming off of our sun disk in the sky here, we're going to need to go down to the dock and then select Settings. From here we'll go to Weather, and in the Weather Settings we'll select Effects. From here we're going to find our smog option. Now as we increase the smog value, it's going to increase the atmospheric effects in our scene. And because there is going to be more particulate matter, we're going to start to see light rays coming off of our sun disk as they pass through the trees. Let's go ahead and take that all the way up to a value of 100%. And now you'll see that as we move through the scene, we can see those light rays coming off of the sun disk very clearly through the trees. To work with the haze setting on our light, we'll first, of course, need a light in our scene. So we'll go to our library panel and then go to lights. And I'm going to use IES01 here, which is basically a spotlight. So I'm going to pull it up into position so that it matches the window frame here. Let's go ahead and rotate it so it's at a bit of an angle. And we'll just make sure that it's in the correct spot. We're going to use this light to simulate the moonlight coming in through this skylight. From here now I'm going to set the intensity to 1000 lumens. Then I'm going to set the color to about 12,000 Kelvin, giving it more of a blue cast. I'm going to change the angle of my spotlight here to 70 degrees. Now we'll need to move it into a slightly better position so it more matches up with our window. And we'll set the attenuation to 5 meters so that it has a bit more of a spread here. Now all we have to do is turn the haze on. But you can see that the haze is a bit too pronounced and it's not really affecting the window the way we'd like it to. So we're not seeing the really nice light rays coming out of the window here. So to help improve that, we're also going to turn shadows on and this will help our light rays to more fit the shape of the window. And then we'll go into more for our shadows and we're gonna turn volumetric shadows on. Now you can really start to see the crisp edge of our light rays coming through the window here. Let's go back up a level, and then under Haze, we'll go under More. And this gives us access to three more settings. We have Intensity, Speed, and Tiling. Intensity will, of course, allow us to control how strong the dust particles or haze appears. So obviously, if I slide this up higher, the haze will appear to get much stronger, much thicker. And of course, in this case, I think we're going to want to bring this down to a much lower value, something a little bit lighter, perhaps around 10%. Now, you may notice that the haze appears to be animating or moving through the light rays. We can control the speed of that animation using the speed setting here. So obviously, a higher value here is going to make the dust particles appear to move faster through the light rays, while obviously a lower value, that's going to slow them down. I'm going to keep mine at about 4 or 5%. Finally, we have the tiling option. The lower this value is, the more uniform the haze will appear. But if you increase the tiling option up to a higher value, you'll start to see kind of clumps in the haze. And this can give a more smoky effect or a more smoggy effect. And depending on the lighting situation that you're working with, this may be the desirable approach. But in this case, because I'm working with light rays coming from the moon and a relatively clean house, I want to keep my tiling down kind of low so it doesn't appear so smoky. So if we were to move outside the house now, we'll clearly see 
where are light sources coming from and the haze effect that it's generating. So obviously at this point we'd simply want to alter the location of the light so that it uh, fits our window just a little bit better here. So now we can see inside that the light rays appear a lot sharper because we've got a better position now of the light source. When exporting a sequence out of twin motion, we can improve upon the quality of the haze and volumetric fog. Simply go to the edit menu and select preferences. From here, select export under settings and you should find smog and haze quality. Just make sure that that is enabled and then when you do your exports, the smog quality will be greatly improved. Area lights have now been added to twin motion, allowing us to simulate light emission from large areas such as bay windows or ceiling panels. Using the new area light makes it quicker to illuminate an area, since we no longer need to place and manipulate multiple lights to achieve a similar result. Using area lights versus multiple point or spotlights also offers improved performance. This nighttime scene is a little too dark, and it's a perfect candidate for using an area light to brighten things up. We'll find the area light by going to the library panel, and then from here we'll go to lights. From here we simply need to drag the area light into the scene. The area light is represented by a cubic gizmo. What we need to do is specify the length and the width of our area light. So I'll set my length to 10, and I'll also set my width to 10. If we move out of the room, we can position the light so that it covers up the entire room. With the light covering the entire room, we can adjust the intensity to make it brighter. Attenuation helps to control the brightness, so by increasing it, we're actually increasing the height of the box, and this will allow light to filter down from the light source. For instance, if I bring the attenuation down very low, you can see that the box is now much shorter. Light is only being applied inside the box. So let's go ahead and bring the attenuation back up higher. I brought the area light down closer to the floor and adjusted the attenuation length and width to 3 meters each. If we go under More, under Attenuation, you're going to find the Edges Angle option. The Edges Angle option will allow you to control the falloff between the center of the light and the edge. You can see at 0% that the area light's edge is very sharp. But as we bring this up higher, it begins to fade. And this will of course allow you to smooth out the area lighting in your scene. Twin Motion 2020 also comes with a new physically based atmospheric sun and sky system. This new system will allow for the creation of much more realistic exteriors regardless of locale, season, or time of day. We'll find the physical sky model by going to the dock and selecting settings. From here we need to select location. The first step in creating our physically accurate sky is to select our location. We can of course drag this picker around on the map or we can search for a location using the magnifying glass. Once we've selected our location, we can now change time of day, the month of the year, and we can adjust the north offset. The new model is more physically accurate, so all of the colors that you see in the sky will be more representative of what we would see in reality. I'll go ahead and set my time of day to somewhere around sunrise, and I'll change the month to July. Finally, I can control the northern offset to get the sun exactly where I'd like it to be. The new physical sky model will help your exterior scenes to look much more physically accurate and realistic. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this tutorial on some of the new lighting features to be found in Twin Motion 2020.